All right, thanks, Jim, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here to hear about um, our VMAX platform. So to frame uh, my presentation, uh, I'd like to uh, frame it against the backdrop of the astounding uh, technological developments that have taken place um, in the biosciences over the relatively uh, recent past. Uh, things that used to be uh, really expensive that required specialized teams with large budgets and access to resources are now uh, widely available uh, to the average graduate student in a typical biotech lab. So for example, we could take uh, DNA synthesis as an example. So this is a, a technique that was uh, first, uh, the first gene that was reported uh, as uh, being chemically synthesized was reported in 1970. It was a 77 base pair gene, and it took that group five years to synthesize. Today, uh, it's a shameless plug for my company, you can go down to the exhibit hall and talk to somebody at the SGI DNA booth who'd be happy to uh, take your DNA uh, sequence and for a reasonable price in a couple of days give you a gene, a, a, a gene that you can use for your research. Or if you wanted to go a different route, they'd be happy to talk to you about the BioXP 3200 DNA printer, which can manufacture uh, 32 genes simultaneously in a single overnight automated run. We could also think about uh, sequencing capabilities. So I have colleagues that are not too much older than myself uh, whose entire PhD theses were devoted to the identification and the sequencing of a handful of genes. With NGS technologies available today, you can sequence an entire organism in a matter of hours to days, depending on the complexity. And with the ever-increasing power of computers and the streamlining of bioinformatics algorithms and the development of new tools, you can now analyze that sequencing data in short order to come up with uh, new insights or hypotheses to direct your research. I say all of this uh, to point out that, in my mind, the bottleneck has shifted from technology like this uh, to the model organisms that are actually employed in your standard biotech lab. Organisms like E. coli, which haven't really seen any major advances uh, for the past uh, decades. So in our group, we started to ask the question, instead of adapting a particular biotech process to be compatible with current model organisms like E. coli, uh, knowing their limitations, what if instead we used our core capabilities to identify, domesticate, and optimize an optimal host for a job at hand? So I know this is protein science week, uh, but I'm at a, I work for a company that, that passes multiple megabases of synthetic DNA through its cloning pipeline every year. And so we began by thinking, how could we increase throughput through our DNA assembly pipeline. Now, I'm imagining most of you are familiar with this process of cloning, which begins with the generation of DNA fragments of interest that you then assemble together into a suitable vector, say maybe an expression vector, that then you introduce into your cloning host, which is again typically E. coli. In order to isolate individual members of that population, you plate that out on agar plates, which you incubate uh, for um, typically overnight. And then you retrieve that plate the next day to find, hopefully, if you've done things correctly, colonies that then you can scale up in liquid culture to isolate plasma DNA. As you look at this uh, overview of this process, you'll notice that the majority of the time that's invested in this process is taken up just waiting for stuff to grow, which isn't very efficient. So we started thinking, well, what kind of organism would we want if we wanted to uh, improve throughput through the cloning process. And we came up with a, a, a small list of traits. One is we want an organism that's classified as a BSL-1 organism, which means that you can use it in a typical molecular biology lab without any special biocontainment uh, rules. Obviously, we want something that grows very fast. We want something that grows uh, in, in routine or low-cost media. It's going to be a non-starter if this thing grows in something that costs $1,000 a liter. We want something that we can genetically engineer in case we need to make improvements. And it would be really nice if this organism was compatible with the standard uh, cloning protocols, kits, uh, reagents um, that are ubiquitous in your standard molecular biology lab. So with all this in mind, uh, we started to do some work in trying to track down a host. And we came across this report from 1961 describing an organism uh, that at the time was called Pseudomonas natriogens, which was later reclassified as Vibrio natriogens, which happens to be a gram-negative marine bacterium 
It's got a BSL-1 status. And it's interesting because it has the fastest reported growth rate of any known organism. And we also found it interesting that since this report in 1961, nothing has been done to develop, develop genetic tools or methods uh, to manipulate this organism. So we got this organism in-house, a number of different strains, and we began to call the program VMAX. Uh, so you'll see a transition in what, we, what we're calling it at this point. And we characterized the strains that we got in-house uh, in a number of ways. So what you're seeing here is a, a growth curve showing the, the growth of the different strains in the shake flasks. Uh, we went ahead and we sequenced and annotated the genomes of the different strains we had, and we performed various analysis um, on the genomic data looking for things like the presence of virulence factors, things that uh, I wouldn't want to, to be working with um, myself or my team uh, to expose us to risk. And we identified through all of this and, and other things I'm not showing, a, a candidate strain that we decided to take forward. So we wanted to ask the question, well, how does it actually perform in the laboratory compared to the incumbent E. coli? And what you're seeing here is a comparison of VMAX uh, to a number of common E. coli cells. So we have a cloning strain, we have a protein expression strain, and we have a strain that is marketed as being a fast-growing E. coli strain. And what you're seeing is that when you culture these in shake flasks under uh, typical laboratory conditions, that VMAX uh, grows two to three times faster than the E. coli strains and to a much higher density. And this faster growth rate also transfers to solid media, whereas depicted here on just standard LB auger plates, you can see individual colonies uh, of pickable size forming in less than six hours with VMAX, where it does take the overnight incubation for those colonies to appear uh, for the E. coli strains. So encouraged by this, we went ahead and developed a suite of genetic tools. So we developed methods for transformation through electroporation or chemical competence as well as conjugation. We identified a suite of functional uh, plasmid origins of replications as well as selectable markers for positive and negative selection. We were able to demonstrate that it was compatible with typical DNA assembly and cloning methods. It grows in readily available growth media, and you can pull DNA back out of it using uh, standard commercial kits. So we took this further and developed um, some tools for genome engineering so that we could make modifications. Uh, so depicted here is our allylic exchange uh, plasmid method, uh, which I won't go into the details. If you're interested, this was published in detail last year in Nature Methods, and you can actually dig in and see the exact protocols. But suffice it to say, you can use this method to make uh, targeted chromosomal deletions, insertions of new DNA, or replacements of uh, endogenous sequence with uh, synthetic sequence. And using these techniques, we were able to make some strain improvements. So we were able to remove things like nucleases to improve the integrity of isolated plasmid DNA. We were able to knock out things like proteases to um, improve the integrity of expressed proteins. We were able to improve the robustness of the strain under laboratory conditions by adding certain genes. And we added certain uh, new functions like the T7 expression system, which I will get into later. So with all this said, how does it actually perform as a cloning host? So again, here on the top, I'm showing the uh, typical cloning pipeline. And what you're seeing on the right is a workflow. So with E. coli, uh, a typical process would involve assembling of a plasmid, say, after lunch on day one, uh, after which you would uh, transform said plasmid into your host strain, you'd recover the strain, you'd plate it out on auger plates, and then you'd have to incubate for 12 to 16 hours. So you typically do that overnight. You come in the next day and hopefully you, you see colonies that have formed. And at some point later in that day, usually before you head home, you inoculate uh, individual colonies into liquid culture so that you can scale up the culture overnight uh, to get enough biomass to do a plasmid prep. We found that using VMAX, if you follow the similar scheme, by the beginning of day two, you have nice juicy colonies that you can pick and grow up for less than three hours to have sufficient biomass uh, to isolate plasmid DNA. We also found that this uh, protocol is fairly flexible. So if you start earlier in, in the day, in day one, you have enough time to actually plate and get colonies by the end of day one that you can scale up overnight uh, to prep plasmid early in the morning of day two. Or uh, if you'd like to punish your graduate students, you can actually do the entire process in a single day if you start early enough and you stay in the lab uh, late enough. 
So we were really encouraged by this, uh, and we anticipate launching uh, a cloning strain with uh, some various be bells and whistles later this year. But enough about cloning. I think most of you are here to talk about proteins. So we realized that a lot of the bottlenecks in routine laboratory protein expression are the same bottlenecks that you see in molecular cloning in terms of waiting for things to grow before you can induce them, waiting for things to grow before you have sufficient biomass to have enough protein to do something useful with. And so we were curious what VMAX would do for protein expression. So first we were able to demonstrate that our VMAX strain is compatible with most common expression plasmids and inducible promoters that people use for systems like E. coli. So your typical IPTG or arabinose or temperature inducible promoters all work uh, very well in VMAX. And the plasmids, uh, or the, at least the origins of the plasmids that people use for protein expression also function quite well in VMAX. So we took this a step further and using our genome engineering techniques, we introduced uh, a cassette into the chromosome with an inducible T7 RNA polymerase. So in this case, you can turn the T7 RNA polymerase gene on with an IPTG inducible promoter. And we have another version with an arabinose inducible promoter. And for those of you that are familiar with the T7 system in E. coli, you know that by inducing the expression of this RNA polymerase, you can then drive high-level protein expression of genes uh, like this GFP gene that's under the control of the T7 promoter. And indeed, when we introduce this plasmid into our engineered strains, as you can see here from uh, this image, you get uh, robust GFP expression. In fact, you get enough that you can actually just see it under white light that you don't see in just wild-type unengineered strains. We've gone ahead and we've tested a number of other diverse targets, uh, some of which are uh, top-selling biologics, or industrially relevant enzymes, and have found, again, you get nice high expression in the VMAX system. And we've also stumbled across a number of proteins, uh, which, when expressed in E. coli, uh, are directed to insoluble inclusion bodies, but these same proteins are expressed uh, very nicely in soluble active form in the VMAX system. So in terms of some actual kind of metrics around this, in terms of a comparison, we went ahead and compared VMAX uh, to E. coli for a, a particular biologic. And what you're seeing here is that uh, when grown in shake flasks under comparable conditions, you get three times more biomass uh, in, with VMAX than you do for E. coli. This translates, as you can see from this SDS page uh, gel of total protein, to more of your desired product, which uh, in turn translates to a higher yield. In this case, you have almost a four-fold yield increase uh, per unit culture uh, for uh, just switching to the, the VMAX host. These advantages also translate uh, into uh, more of a, a situation that would look like more of an industrial situation where you're, where you're using something like a fermenter as well, where you can see that uh, with VMAX you're able to induce uh, the culture sooner, it goes to a higher biomass and makes more protein. So just to kind of summarize uh, some of the advantages, uh, one, one of the main advantages is the growth rate of VMAX, which is uh, more than twice as fast as typical uh, protein expression strains of E. coli, which allows you to complete uh, experiments much faster. Uh, the growth conditions are much more flexible, so uh, VMAX grows in the same media that E. coli does, but it also grows under less expensive carbon sources uh, or dirtier carbon sources uh, than E. coli does. It grows uh, over a wide temperature range with optimal growth for protein expression, we found at 30 degrees. Uh, and and uh, this allows uh, one to have more flexibility in their experimental design. We've also found that the lower temperature actually aids in protein solubility in many cases. You get, uh, compared to E. coli, two to four times the biomass, which uh, translates to two to four times the amount of expressed protein. And not only that, but you're able to produce some proteins as soluble active uh, forms which uh, you're not able to produce in E. coli. So VMAX Express is actually now commercially available as of last week, so if anyone's interested in trying this uh, for routine laboratory use, uh, you can purchase it through SGI DNA. So this is the system that contains uh, a T7 expression system for IPTG-induced uh, protein expression of constructs under the T7 promoter. And again, the folks at the SGI 
uh, DNA table in the exhibit hall would be happy to tell you more about this product. So that's all well and good to be able to make more um, uh, intracellularly expressed protein. But uh, I think as most of you know, uh, a key interest is being able to express and secrete proteins of interest as that really drives down the cost of downstream processing. And so uh, we have the genomes of these VMAX strains and so we decided to go and look and see if there was potential for protein secretion. And what we found is that in our VMAX strains there are a number of secretion pathways present that could potentially be leveraged to secrete uh, proteins into the growth media. So using this we relied on a, a very old trick uh, in, in terms of microbial protein secretion where you would grow the organism on different carbon substrates. And it's known that sometimes uh, you'll come across a situation where an organism is able to sense a carbon source that it can't readily utilize. And by sensing it, it's able to induce the expression of enzymes that are secreted into the growth media that can then catabolize that carbon source into a form that the organism can use. And what you're seeing here on this gel is a situation where we actually stumbled across this effect in VMAX. So when you, so this is precipitated protein from the growth media uh, of the strain grown on just uh, a base minimal media. Uh, the media with glucose and the media with sucrose. And you'll notice when it is grown on sucrose, a substrate that E. coli can't utilize, uh, you get the secretion uh, of, of an enzyme into the growth media. So using proteomics, we went ahead and characterized the secretome of uh, VMAX in this particular growth media. And what we found is the most abundant hit is this leaven sucrase protein which is the right molecular weight based on the, the band that we saw on that previous SDS page gel. It has a putative uh, secretion signal sequence and the biology makes sense. So leaven sucrase is a protein that's involved in the catabolism of sucrose and we've, we've, we find this protein when we grow the strain on sucrose as a carbon source. So uh, with this information, we've been able to do some host engineering that I'm not uh, prepared to present today, other than to just show that through host engineering, we've been able to come up with a strain that can secrete uh, that leaven sucrase uh, enzyme uh, to a very high level. So we're secreting about 100 mg per liter, and this is in a, a five-hour fermentation in minimal media in shake flasks. And this number goes up drastically as you increase the time or go to uh, a rich media or to more of a, a, a ferment, uh, like using fermenters. So uh, with my remaining minutes, I just wanted to give you a taste of uh, what's coming next for the VMAX platform. So everything I've described here, we kind of see as the low hanging fruit uh, where we were able to see uh, a market need and come up with a solution to improve the throughput through uh, routine um, molecular biology tasks. But at Synthetic Genomics, we're a synthetic biology company and we're, we're interested in developing kind of next generation advanced tools for synthetic biology. So as by way of another history lesson, uh, most of you will recall that in 1995, there was a significant uh, technological breakthrough where a team uh, led by Craig Venter was able to go from uh, a genome of a natural cell, sequence it using a shotgun approach, and assemble a complete uh, bacterial genome. So this is the first complete genome uh, reported in the literature. And shortly after that time, Craig and his team started to ask the question, well, this is really interesting that we can go from biological material to sequence information that then gets put into a computer database. But what if we could go the other direction? So what if we could start with a database of genes or genetic information design a genome of interest, synthesize it from four bottles of chemicals, assemble the genome, and transplant the genome into an appropriate recipient cell where it would take up residence and in, in effect become the operating system for that cell. And in 2010, uh, work that's coming out of the J. Craig Venner Institute, uh, a team led by Dan Gibson published uh, the creation of a bacterial cell controlled by a chemically synthesized genome. Now in this case, they just took a known genome uh, of a mycoplasma species and synthesized it with a couple of watermarks and were able to transplant it into a related mycoplasma sequence. So this work was, it was taken um, uh, further last year in 2016 
uh, with the publication of the design and synthesis of a minimal bacterial genome. So in this case, they took a natural bacterial genome and they said, okay, now how can we, how can we modify this uh, uh, with the eye of, of cutting out things we don't need um, and making the smallest genome that, that uh, is known to support life. And they succeeded uh, in this uh, project in generating uh, what, what's called uh, SYN3, which is a minimal mycoplasma cell. So through the course of this experiment, uh, they came up with uh, genome design principles and rules, best practices for, for going about designing a genome in silico, building it, and testing it uh, in a, an appropriate uh, recipient species. They came up with rules for minimization, for removing unnecessary pathways, um, uh, competing biological processes that you don't necessarily care about in the laboratory. They came up with ways of defragmenting the genome, which is a process of, of taking genes that have been scattered across the genome uh, through evolution that are involved in similar biological processes and organizing them rationally in a single location on the chromosome so that you can think of them almost like modules. And this is actually what uh, we're now doing with VMAX. So we're currently pursuing uh, minimization to remove unnecessary or uh, pathways that, that complicate the, the processes we're actually trying to get it to achieve. We're modularizing the genome and we're recoding the genome, uh, changing its genetic code uh, to free up uh, codons and make it phage resistant uh, to generate a next generation, generation chassis for biotechnology that we hope will have an impact in various uh, areas of the, the biotech sector. So with that, um, I'd just like to give you kind of an overview of uh, the customer facing side of our company, which is through SGI DNA. Uh, so SGI DNA offers uh, uh, DNA synthesis services, uh, like I mentioned earlier in my presentation, but also uh, sequencing services. Uh, they, they offer a robust, robust uh, bioinformatics platform that can do um, all sorts of analysis uh, that you can license. A number of reagents that uh, speed molecular biology workflows, so the Gibson assembly reagents uh, that were developed by Dan Gibson and his team, and uh, as well as now the, the VMAX uh, cell line, and instruments, so the BioXP3200, which I mentioned earlier, uh, an automated DNA printer uh, for gene synthesis. So with that, I would just like to thank a number of people. Uh, first, the leadership uh, at Synthetic Genomics for their support of this program. I'd like to thank Eric and Chris, uh, who are instrumental members of my research team. Uh, other, other members of Synthetic Genomics who participated by helping with sequencing or bioinformatics support. And then the team at SGI DNA, uh, who uh, took this, this uh, proof of concept and actually put it in a box uh, to where you can buy and use it today. So uh, with that, uh, I'll end my presentation, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions you might have. Amazing uh, how this system works. Uh, is the uh, yield of the DNA um, from uh, volume similar to E. coli? Um, so we found Largely, yeah, kind of ballpark figures, it's, it's similar to E. coli. Uh, we, we're now embarking on a process of like actually looking at those plasmids and looking at copy number um, to get like a, a more refined view of, of how they're behaving in VMAX versus in E. coli. But yeah, so your yields of PUC or your yields of uh, PACYC184, whatever mm -hmm. it is, are going to be comparable to what you would see in E. coli. And it looks like that the expression of recombinant protein is, uh, is, is better. Uh, I don't know how many uh, proteins you already tested. Um, is there, uh, uh, what is this, the scope of expression which you can uh, use for uh, how, how low can you go in temperature and what is actually the, the optimal uh, temperature for growth? Um, is that 37 degrees or? You... So if you're just going for speed and you want to collect biomass, uh, 37 degrees is, is uh, the, the, the most ideal temperature. And that's what we have been using for kind of cloning applications. We found with protein expression that if you decrease to 30 degrees, you take a small hit in terms of growth rate, but the overall yield of protein is higher. So that's the temperature we were recommending for that process. 
But of course, just like with E. coli, where uh, you know you might throw a, a flask in a in a room at like 17 or 20 degrees to um, try to to get uh, proteins that are known to uh, you know, go into inclusion bodies to fold correctly. You, you see something similar with Vmax, where the lower temperature does seem to aid with um, with protein folding. And, and uh, when do you reach the heat shock situation at 42 degrees, or can it grow uh, at much, much higher temperatures as well? So we haven't tested much beyond 45 degrees. So you can you can shock it at, at 45, and uh, and it will grow. But be, beyond that, we haven't it, we haven't pushed it beyond that. So.